Hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm Michael Lingenfelter, and I'm here with the Aging Athlete Guide, which is a show on how to get the most out of yourself so you can get the most out of what you love to do. I'm here to bring you the experts to share their knowledge, insights, and stories to make sure you can keep moving without the worries of age slowing you down. And today we're jo joined by Kenneth J, better known in the States as KJ. De <laughs> Dr. Kenneth J holds a master's degree in exercise physiology with a specialty in cardiovascular function and a PhD in sports science and clinical biomechanics. He is a researcher based in Denmark and a adjunct professor of human performance and clinical biomechanics at the Carrick Institute in Orlando, Florida. And with 20 plus years of experience in the fitness industry and more than a decade of consulting experience for the international and Olympic level athletes, KJ has instructed and coached some of the best. And in 2014, he authored one of my favorite books and one that I give to many of my clients, Cardio Code Book. Um, and he has also created the Cardio Code and Kinetic Code certification courses um, with a deep interest in the link between the body and the brain. Kenneth is specialized in a neuro physio biomechanical approach to health and performance enhancement. So welcome to the show, KJ. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Great to of be course. here. Of course. Awesome. Um, so that word neuro physio biomechanical approach. Um, yeah. What is that? What is that? What does that mean? Unpackage that a little bit for me. Yeah. So, well, <laughs> well, basically with my background in, um, in exercise physiology, I'm very much interested in how the, how the body works. Mm -hmm. um, but in recent years, and I can't believe I'm saying recent years, but it's probably been more than 10 years now, I've had a, had a deep interest in also in how the brain works and basically uh, trying to understand uh, what is going on in the brain when we exercise. So mm -hmm. that's where the neuro part comes in. And the whole biomechanical issue is, is, is well, my PhD is partly in, in clinical biomechanics. So so it's, it's basically trying to link the brain together with the physiology with the body and the, um, the anatomy of the body and the, the physics that, that ultimately govern how we move in space and time. Got yeah. it. Got yeah. it. And so today we're going to be talking a lot about cardio. Cardio seems like it is like the word in the fitness and health in industry. But in mm -hmm. what I've come to learn in my, my past three, four years is that it may be the most misunderstood word in the fitness world. And so when we talk about cardio, what does that word mean? Well, um, yeah, see, that's, um, that's the interesting thing is, is that it, it actually has a very specific meaning. Um, cardio uh, is derived from the Greek word cardia, which basically means heart. So when we talk about cardio training, we're talking about training that targets the heart to get healthier, to get better and um, to get more, well, let's just call it resilient towards uh, cardiovascular diseases. So, so, so when we talk about cardiovascular training, we're talking about training the heart and the vascular system to be better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. So a heart that is healthy is a heart that's more resilient to diseases. That's what we're looking to improve if mm -hmm. we're trying to improve our cardio. Absolutely. So, that's one, that's one of the aspects anyway. So then, oh. then there's the whole performance aspects mm -hmm. of the cardiovascular, um, scene and the cardiovascular training as well. Um, but basically, uh, you can say is that 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 the big misunderstanding and what ultimately ultimately uh, made me write the cardio code book and create the courses is that um, I was on the internet and I heard some people refer to cardio. Well, you could just do your cardio by lifting weights faster. Mm. And that kind of made me, oh, that's not anywhere near where, what cardio is. And that actually made me sit down and write uh, the Cardio Code book. Because if that's, the, if that's how people, if that's what people think of cardio is that they can skip the running, the biking, the rowing, the, 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 the a taking a brisk walk and just substitute it with some 
some fast lifting of some weights, be it kettlebells, dumbbells, or barbells, or whatever, they're missing out on, on, on so many really, really cool adaptations that only happen to the body when you subject it to real cardiovascular training, which will which is defined as running, rowing, biking, skiing. The Versa climber machine also can be constituted as real cardio and then mm-hmm. cross country skiing. Yeah. Yeah. And so does that thought process come from I can feel my heart beating harder, therefore it must be cardio? Yeah, um, I usually joke around a little bit, and I usually say is, is, say is that um, if if building your cardio and building your cardiovascular system, if all it takes is a high heart rate, I can scare you into better shape, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's definitely not the case, and every, uh, and 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 you can basically just I usually use this example at my courses is that. If you've ever tried like uh, standing on the top of a ladder and changing out a light bulb or having to like um, like uh, put a nail or a screw in the wall or in the ceiling uh, and you're in this very awkward position and your arm is uh, is over your head for an extended period of time, uh, you will start to sweat and your heart rate will go up. And in some cases, that heart rate can get really, really high. If, if you're really struggling to keep your balance and keeping your arm in that static position, it's not uncommon to see heart rates of 120, 130, 140, maybe even 150 if you're really straining. But that has absolutely no positive effect on the heart whatsoever. Right. And if a high heart rate was all it takes, then then that would be a cardio building workout as well but clearly, yeah so yeah it sounds like i mean i hear it all the time with a misunderstanding of i'm going to go outside get a walk and get my cardio um it's this word that i think is very correlated to heart rate so um talk mm-hmm. to us a little bit about if it's not correlated necessarily to heart rate what are we looking to make um what changes are we looking to make specifically in the heart and how do we make those changes mm. Yeah. Well, uh, we just got to clarify one thing first is that if you do activities like uh, locomotion, you're you're walking, running, light jogging, running, sprinting, stuff like that. If you're on a on a bike, uh, you're cycling, if you're doing uh, rowing or you're doing cross country skiing, then heart rate is a is a perfectly valid measurement Mm. of of a good cardiovascular stimulus. But if you're lifting weights or you're doing isometric work, you're doing farmer's walks, you're doing pull-ups, you're doing uh, 20 rep breathing squats and stuff like that, then heart rate is not uh, the ideal measurement to to measure um, the adaptations on your heart. So we have to distinguish between those two. Got it. That's really important. Yeah. But basically, and, and, and what really determines um, um, the adaptations is, uh, and, and, and what happens is, the, is how the heart is being put under load during the activity. Because what happens in a, in a cyclical motion, we can use a stationary bike as an example, and we can also, uh, uh, the same thing will apply to rowing or, or running. But let's say you're on a stationary bike and you're just uh, doing your RPMs and uh, you're increasing increasing the intensity as, as what you're doing it, and then your heart rate goes up. That heart rate is very specifically correlated to your oxygen uptake. That means mm-hmm. that uh, the harder you go, the higher the heart rate, and the more blood with oxygen your heart will pump to your working muscles. And uh, what ha- when you're on a bike, um, that happens because the flow back to the heart is not being restricted, which means that the heart gets what's called ample preload, which means that uh, all the deoxygenated blood that returns to the heart, that has pretty much like a clear passage to the right side of the heart that receives all the deoxygenated blood. And that allows for a bigger preload of the heart. That's what it's called. And a bigger preload basically means that the heart is forced over time to expand like a balloon, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Now compare that scenario with, let's say, the the twenty rep breathing squat. Um, you can still get like really high heart rate uh, heart rate peaks. I've seen people getting to heart rate one hundred and eighty during a breathing twenty rep breathing squat, right? But the major difference is, is that because your mus- working muscles, they're basically occluded from that all that oxygenated blood going to them, which also means that the 
that the amount of um, amount of, uh, of of pressure that the heart has to overcome in order to receive all the blood going back uh, is extremely extensive, mm-hmm. and that adaptation um, that's something that's called afterload. So when you do weight training, you have increased afterload on the heart, which means the heart has to work a lot harder in order to receive all that blood and oxygenate it again. That um, induces adaptations to the heart known as um, known as concentric hypertrophy of the heart wall, whereas uh, being on the bike, it was eccentric uh, hypertrophy. Eccentric means basically, in this case, expanding the heart, mm-hmm. and concentric basically means uh, compressing around. So what this basically means if we look at the heart as a balloon or the uh, the, the ventricles of the heart as uh, as a balloon during the cycling uh, motion you're kind of stretching the heart wall so more blood will fit inside uh, inside of the the cavities okay right Whereas when you're getting a high heart rate uh, by doing the 20 rep breathing squat or any other type of, of, of resistance training movement, you're basically inducing uh, hypertrophy of the heart wall. And that means that the heart wall, it will grow inward, reducing the cavity size within mm-hmm. the ventricle. So less blood will fit. Hmm. This is not something that happens overnight. This happens over the course of years and years and years. Yeah. Right? So yeah. that's basically the, the the biggest difference is that real cardio trains an expansion of the heart, um, and lifting weights faster basically induces this uh, this concentric hypertrophy where there's less room for blood in the ventricles. Got it. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. And uh, and I I would like a little bit more clarification because I think I'm on I, I think I'm with you as far as when I'm doing strength training. What is actually not allowing the you to get the cardiovascular benefit now that we put a definition to it. What's going on there that the strength training is not allowing that? Yeah. So basically uh, what happens is that uh, because when you're under load uh, and the load doesn't even have to be that uh, that great. uh, But let's say uh, let's stay with the 20 uh, rep breathing squat example again. You have that load on your back and you're um, and you're doing your squats in order to support that load and in order to uh, to maintain proper posture and not get injured and all these things. You have to create some sort of rigid uh, r- rigid structure that will keep you upright. That's basically what's referred to as 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 bracing or basically just stiffening your rib cage so you don't mm. crumble underneath the weight. And a huge uh, all that stiffness, all that tension around your torso um, actually cre- uh, increases the um, the intrathoracic pressure inside the body. And we have two big veins that that are responsible for returning blood from the entire body back to the heart. We have what's called the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. The superior vena cava returns blood from the upper body and the brain. And the inferior vena cava returns blood from... um, the abdomen and the legs. Um, what and what basically happens is that when we increase the intrathoracic pressure, then we squeeze off the blood uh, uh, by squeezing the superior and inferior vena cava, so blood cannot return to the heart. Mm-hmm. Right? And then the, the heart basically has to start working as a suction device in order to get the blood through. So the heart is fighting that resistance uh, the body is creating uh, from that tension of staying, uh, staying underneath load. So that's, uh, the, the, that's the primary thing that happens. And that's the primary reason why lifting weights is not really cardio because it does the opposite thing of what a cardiovascular stimulus is supposed to do. Got it. So if we're looking to have um, create better health through strength training, then it would make sense that if you want to be healthy, then you also need to have a separate component of cardio that is not in strength training based. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's never a question of either or having to choose between cardio or strength training, because we also know there are so many tremendous benefits from strength training that you don't get from cardiovascular training. Mm -hmm. Just have to think about, we got two different systems. We got the musculoskeletal system and we got the cardiovascular system. We got two different systems in the body and we have to 
give equal attention to both if we want to live a long, healthy uh, life. Yes. Yeah. And so and so when it comes to the cardiovascular side of it, I know you breezed over it quickly. Could you name some of the activities that we could be doing that would fit into that category of cardiovascularly yeah. beneficial? Yeah. Absolutely. So there are a couple of, couple of rules that you can you can think of when you, you if if you're kind of wondering if an exercise could be a cardiovascular exercise. Um, the, the the standard go tos are cycling, okay. uh, rowing. Rowing is, however, a little bit interesting because it it actually does a little bit more strength training stimulus. So let's come back to the rowing rowing part as well. But but cycling. Cross-country skiing, uh, locomotive activities like uh, walking, running, sprinting, all fits into that category. Um, and then there's this, uh, it's not that common to see, but, uh, but the Versa climber, that climbing mm -hmm. action that you can do. Uh, people who've seen Rocky IV uh, with Dolph Lundgren training for the fight, <laughs> he was on one of those back in the, back in the 80s in the yes. Russian training yes. facility. Uh, that's been tested quite extensively um, in, in research and in the literature, and, and that is uh, definitely on par with, uh, with cycling and running and rowing. So those are basically it. Those are your options. Then people usually ask me about what about uh, skipping rope or jump roping, um, and uh, it 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 actually doesn't have the uh, capability. The intensity cannot get high enough, and, mm. and that's merely because of a um, uh, because the majority of the muscle mass that's active is basically your calves, right? Mm. And then, mm -hmm. uh, this perfectly illustrates that one of the things that you have to look for if you're wondering if an activity is a cardiovascular one, uh, the research says that a minimum of 50% of your total body mus muscle mass have to be active huh. during, during it. The next thing you have to look at is that is the activity cyclical in nature? Right. So it, it, does it keep going or do you uh, like round and round uh, treading uh, the pedals around on a bike or the rowing stroke or the cross country uh, movement? Or do you have to stop, reset and then go again between each rep? That's also if, if you have to do that, then it's likely not a cardiovascular exercise. Got it. Um, and then and this is a big one. Your breathing has to be more or less unrestricted. Right. So if there is a significant amount of breath holding involved mm. or reduced breathing, then it is not possible for the exercise to, to be able to elicit a full cardiovascular response. Got it. Right? And so, so those you, are three things that you, can, that you can ask yourself if you're wondering, uh, is this exercise a cardiovascular exercise? Using 50% of my muscle mass, it's cyclical and breathing is unrestricted. Yes. Awesome. Um, and so why cyclical? What is it about the cyclical nature of an exercise that puts it into that category? Well, the, the, the thing is, it's, a, it's, actually about, it's actually about repetitions because for every repetition that you do, there's a contraction phase and there's a relaxation phase. Mm -hmm. And the more, um, the more repetitions per minute that you do, the more contraction and relaxation phases are there. And it's, the, it's in the relaxation phase of the uh, contraction that the muscle fibers actually get the oxygen. Because as, uh, when, uh, when the muscle contracts, it actually shuts off its own blood supply, <laughs> right? So it's in the relaxation phase that it gets that rush of fresh blood um, and, uh, and the oxygen diffuses over the membrane to get into the muscle fiber, right? Got it. So the more reps that you do, the higher of an indi uh, the, the better of an indicator it is that this exercise that you're dealing with may actually have potential to be a, a, a cardiovascular one. That's why I back in the day I looked at kettlebell uh, swings and snatches mm -hmm. because you can do those uh, you can do those in a cyc cyclical um, in a cyclical way. You don't have to reset, and and your breathing can more or less also go unrestricted and stuff like that. So so that's why I looked at that as an exercise as a weightlifting exercise that comes pretty close at being a cardiovascular. A cardiovascular. Yeah. Nice. And when you're doing, I'm sure you've done a ton of research and still are doing a ton of research. Mm -hmm. um, what 
what are you looking for when you're going out there? And I mean, let's, uh, it, the web can be, the internet can be a scary place for trying to find information because <laughs> uh, you, you come across things that are mostly either biased or are not done well in studies. So when you're going out yeah. there and doing the research, what is it that you're looking for in order to qualify this as a good study? Yeah, that's a great question. It's probably one of the first or second time someone's asked me that in an interview like that. But I like that question. Um, yeah, uh, I totally agree that uh, that the internet is uh, you can you can find all sorts of wrong information on the internet. Um, usually, um, what I don't consider scientific is 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 personal anecdotes, YouTube videos, <laughs> gut feelings personal experience and 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 any website that doesn't have a uh, that doesn't have a history of listing references um, from where they get their information mm -hmm. so if I read an article one of the very first things I'll do um, if, if the website is not a, a a scientific one that publishes scientific literature I scroll all the way to the bottom and I see if they if they have the reference list there, and if I know that what the I usually read the first couple of sentences in the, in the, in the article, and then I scroll down, and then I see if the literature uh, list and the links that they have provided to the studies, they actually match what the article is about, because mm. some some people out there uh, apparently. Uh, put in a lot of extra references for it to look good, and sometimes actually the references are um, are showing the complete opposite of what they're trying to 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 talk about. As uh, so 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 sometimes references are also being used in a in a very sketchy format. Got it. So that's one of the things that I do. Uh, and then uh, when I look at sci the, the scientific literature, I have like a hierarchy um, I go by. So case reports, opinion papers, letters to the editor, stuff like that, even though it's published on PubMed, uh, I give that uh, like a, I wouldn't say a red flag, but I, by, but I consider that, that as very weak evidence, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's mm -hmm. very, uh, it's it's actually very simple to write up a case report or a letter to the editor and get it published. Yeah, right. Um, a little bit better than that, I would say animal studies uh, or in vitro studies. So basically petri dish studies uh, or studies done with uh, rats and mice. Um, they are a little bit better, but still, um, I kind of flag it as, as kind of weak, especially when we're talking about apply, applying the science to, um, to our clients, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then, um, cross-sectional studies, uh, like epidemiological studies, stuff like that. That again is a little bit better. Case control studies, cohort studies, it gets a little bit better. But what I'm really looking for, I'm looking for uh, randomized controlled trials, mm -hmm. um, if possible, blinded ones, or even better, double blinded. Double blinded is hard to do when you're when you're doing stuff with uh, with with figuring out what type of exercise works best because it's hard to blind the research participant and those types of, <laughs> of, of, of studies, right? Yeah. Uh, but, but, but at least single blinded randomized controlled trials. Um, and then uh, at the very top of, 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 of this hierarchy, we, uh, we find the, um, um, the meta-analysis uh, and the systematic reviews. So that's basically where they take a bunch of randomized controlled trials and they have a lot of inclusion and exclusion criteria for those, and they try to figure out what what does the what does this pool of the randomized controlled trials what is uh, what what are they collectively saying? Is there mm -hmm. a conclusion to be drawn from this pool of different studies? Um, so so that's basically my hierarchy. And when I look at a randomized controlled trial, I usually always jump to the methods section. And depending on what the study is about, um, uh, it, it differs from what I look at. But, but I always look at uh, number of research participants because mm -hmm. some randomized controls are, that are done are done with like six or eight people. 
And then if, if I see that, that it doesn't necessarily mean that I reject it completely, but then I go to the statistics section and then I look at the statistics. What kind of statistics are you doing with five, six, seven or eight people? <laughs> Because mm -hmm. if you do very advanced statistics uh, on that, um, th then it's a huge red flag, for instance. Yeah. So, so stuff like that. Um, yeah. What yeah. are they using to measure? Um, so if you're looking for adaptations in the heart, how are they going about measuring an increase or decrease in performance of that? Yeah, uh, that's um, that's actually something that's been looked at uh, quite extensively, probably for the past 110, 120 years or so. Mm -hmm. So, 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 what they do is they do spirometry. So, so it's basically gas ex exchange analysis. So they they measure how much O2 and CO2 there is in the inspired air, and then they measure how much is expelled during a work working protocol during like a ramp protocol on a treadmill for instance or on a bike and then you analyze that um, that gas exchange what goes uh, what is going on and then you can figure out how much oxygen is the body actually using because more oxygen will be going in that's going to be uh, then there is going to be coming out hmm. so you know and then know um, that the body uses that and then we can basically calculate what's called the oxygen uptake the maximum oxygen uptake also referred to as vo2 max uh, these days it's 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 a lot easier to to measure that because back in the day when 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 i was studying exercise physiology we did this with like a douglas bag method where we basically had the athletes who were exercising on the exercise bike they were they had a mouthpiece and they had mm -hmm. like a huge balloon attached to it so we had this huge balloon that was basically filling up the entire room with all the <laughs> expired air and then we would go to the lab and analyze all that but now it uh, but now it's um it's pretty much done online uh, and you can even get like portable instruments that doesn't take up a lot of space and it gives you very accurate measurements. So it's not that hard to do. Um, then if you're looking at, 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 at really going into it, then uh, some studies uh, use uh, ultrasound and actually scan the heart to see mm. what kind of physical adaptations have, uh, have the heart undergone. And what you will usually see with athletes that does this is that they, if they do, do um, even the athlete that does a lot of cardiovascular training, running, or rowing, or cycling and all that, they will usually also see an increase in, in, in uh, ventricular wall thickness. So the wall of the heart will actually grow in thickness as well in these athletes as well. But it will expand so much more, right? Got it. So, 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 so the uh, so the outcome of of those types of training sessions and those studies will be that there is room for a lot more blood to eject per heartbeat uh, than there would be if uh, if an athlete never does any cardiovascular training. But again, and those types of studies takes a long time to measure physiological and anatomical changes. I should yeah. say anatomical, morphological changes. It's much easier just to measure the maximum oxygen uh, uptake. Um, which is a combination of how much blood the heart is ejecting per minute, so the cardiac output, and how much the muscles that are working are are they taking up. So if if, if so so you'll have to you'll when you have the the oxygen uptake measurement, you'll have to just remember that's a combination or the product of how much the heart is pumping and how much blood is being taken up by the working muscles. Got yeah. it. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So that's what we're looking to do is be able to increase the volume and strength per pump to make it a more efficient system. Am, yeah. am I? Okay. Yeah, um, and I, and I could go down the rabbit hole of, um, research, but I'm going to dial it back in so that way we don't lose mm -hmm. everybody. Um, and so, uh, you've mentioned the, um, equipment, right. That we can say is going to be, is going to help have a positive cardio adaptation. And so let's talk about, let's say I'm, I'm someone that I was like, okay, I'm, I'm in it now. I I've heard that cardio is important. I'm in understanding what to do. Where, where do I start as far as maybe intensity, frequency, et cetera? Mm -hmm. 
Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I always love when it, when it, when all this stuff that can sound very complicated and is very complicated is, is boiled down to then what do we actually do to get started? Right. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, how to, because all that knowledge doesn't mean anything <laughs> if you don't go apply it. Right. It doesn't mean anything. So, so I'm glad you asked that. Um, <clears throat> here's the thing. Um, first of all, you, you have to choose an activity that suits you. Right. And that fits your, your your history as well, meaning that it's not I'm very, very fond of the rowing machine, for instance. I, I really like that one. Um, uh, but 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 for some people, that might not be the right tool for some people. They are better off um, using a stationary bike or go biking in nature or whatever. Uh, some people really like to run. Perfect. Then go run. Um, that's all good, but you have to choose between running, rowing, um, cycling, cost crunchy skiing, or if you are so lucky that you have a Versa climber, you can use that one as well. But that's basically your options, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out which one of those, uh, suits you the best, or is it going to be a, a thing where you, sometimes you go biking and sometimes you go rowing and stuff like that. Because it's for the long term. It's not just for the first six weeks of whatever challenge you're signing up for. You've got to no. like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you simply have to find something that, uh, that, uh, that you can at least learn to enjoy with yeah. time. Because I also do know that for a lot of people, a lot of people who gravitate towards strength training is usually because they hate doing the cardiovascular training. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, so I've seen that so many times, right? And usually what's interesting as well, but that's a, probably for, uh, for a different time. But a lot of these people who, who, who are very much into, uh, into strength training, they don't spend the time, uh, doing the cardiovascular training and they oftentimes they try to downplay cardiovascular training's role in health as well. Mm. Uh, and that's unfortunate uh, because that that's basically their own confirmation bias on on, yeah. uh, on, on this. Why do they so don't want to do it? Find something that you at least can learn to enjoy, um, and then there are several different options. But the the, the whole thing is that with cardiovascular training, uh, you can get good results from two to three times a week uh, without sounding too much like an infomercial from some. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some sort of training device. But again, mm -hmm. there are reasons for why two, three, four times a week seems to uh, seems to work really well because you 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 provide a stimulus to the body, then you rest a little bit and then you do it again. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully you'll do it for life. So what I usually uh, recommend is uh, do something. If it's running, for instance, if you can uh, work up to the point where you can complete a 5K, uh, two or three times a week, that's a really good starting point. And you can start out by just walking, maybe just walking one, uh, one kilometer, uh, then add another, add another, work up to five. Once you can keep going for 5K, then try to do it faster and faster and faster and faster, right? That's, that's a great cardiovascular stimulus because mm -hmm. that's for most people that'll take anywhere from from 20 25 minutes if you're pretty good up into uh, to 30 35 maybe even 40 minutes but who cares just get started yeah um pretty much same thing on the rower um i have a rowing app that hooks up to the concept 2 uh, uh rowing machine um I did this app. It's called the Row Forge. Uh, I did this together with a good friend of mine called Wayne Harlan. He's in uh, in your neck of the woods in Fresno, Fresno California. California. I know, small yeah. world. Yeah, small world. Um, and uh, in in that app, uh, if you've never rowed before, and even if you're in pretty good cardio shape, but you want to get started with rowing, there's a six week startup program in there. And that basically just uh, tells you to row um, three to four times a week and try to complete a 5K and then progressively try to, uh, to, to, to decrease the time it takes you to complete that 5K. And once you've done that for four to six weeks, then you're not a beginner anymore on the rower. And then if you're doing it with running, then you've accumulated uh, enough mileage um, so your, your, your body has gotten accustomed to the motion. So we if just, you're a, if you, if you prefer running, so, and let me preface this by mm -hmm. saying I've, I've really enjoyed rowing about three or four years ago. I got into it and, mm -hmm. um, I downloaded the row forge app, uh, about 
two months ago. And because of my love for numbers and measurements, um, it's been mm -hmm. really fun because yeah. I just get on, push a button, it programs the rower for me. And yeah. I just follow along. And since my brain is like, no matter where you're at, start at the beginning of a program. So I started going yeah. through the six uh, weeks nice. and it's um, finishing up week five. But yeah, I think it's it's fantastic because it, it sets the watts that I'm doing, the power, um, which mm -hmm. sets my pace. And then after four days, um, then it pushes to it, it makes that makes me go a little bit faster. Um, so I love that. But if you if running's your thing, you yeah. said you could approach it the same way, just the same distance, a 5K, um, yeah. run and walk. Um, and then it's every week or so, if you're doing three or four times a week, um, start to increase the pace a little bit. Yeah. So the, the thing is, and this is also one of the things I love with rowing, is that, is that you have the actual power output right there on this, the display in front of you. Yeah. So you know exactly how much power you're generating. And power, mm -hmm. uh, is, is, that's energy, right? So power is measured in watts, and watts are joules per second. And a joule, that's, uh, that, 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 that is the standardized international unit for energy. So mm -hmm. you can basically see at how, how fast are you burning calories, right? Mm -hmm. um, you don't have that luxury if uh, if you're out running. Most people don't have that luxury, um, but you can basically do the same thing, uh, the, the same follow the same principle. Just measure uh, uh, how long it takes you to complete the 5K, right? So you got an average. If you're really geeking it out with that, then you can just calculate an average running speed over the mm -hmm. 5K. So you're running at at X miles per hour for the entire uh, 5K, and then just try to amp it up just a little bit and push yourself. Because beginners have to learn how to how to push themselves. Um, so it's important to start out slow and then gradually build up. And once you've completed six weeks of that with three or four sessions per week, then you have enough experience to start trying some of maybe if it's running so interval based running programs or some of the if it's rowing some of the rowing workouts that we have in the row forge app yeah awesome and i would like to add this on a little bit too just because i think we can get so caught up which i mean i love absolutely love numbers and measurements but getting away from in being aware of what's going on internally and this culture of if it doesn't make me hurt it's probably not benefiting me um, mm -hmm. which I think is a absolutely insane from a no pain, no gain standpoint, there is some mm -hmm. negative sensations with hard work. Yes. Um, but if you're waking up the next day and having a hard time sitting down, um, I would be aware of, Hey, let's just try to do the same amount of work to where I can not feel like I'm beat up or hit by a truck the next yeah. day. Um, and yeah. so like you said, the smallest amount that we can make an improvement without those negative consequences coming in. Absolutely, I couldn't have said it better myself. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, just because it's it's a culture that we're in, and you just gotta like, I'm like, if if there's no pain, no gain, I'm just gonna kick you in your shins, and you're gonna be get, gaining a lot. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. So, <laughs> Um, um, yeah, with all of these things is that you, you just have to be patient and, and think about and this is this is one of the, the probably for people getting started with something is that realizing that this is supposed to be for life. It's not a it's not a four week or a six week fix and then you don't ever have to do it again. Right. Mm -hmm. Because this will only work as long as you keep doing it. Right. So so you just got to remember you're in it for the long haul. And if 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 every time you're literally dying, then mm -hmm. you won't be able to sustain that for the rest of your life. Some days you can push yourself harder. Some days just back off a little bit. Totally cool. But just uh, if, what I really like is uh, like you is that if you have a measurement, then you know exactly where you are and then you don't have to guess. And that's mm -hmm. one of the, the, the cool things I, I like uh, with the rowing, uh, rowing machine because you got get that absolute number. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And for those of you who've never rowed before, um, I highly recommend, especially if you are – actually, I won't even say an age. Um, but what I've learned – so I've, I've done quite a bit of running and I've never really loved it. But I know that it can be a little bit more impactful on the joints. Yeah. But this rowing machine allows you to really push up intensity without as much um, impact on joints. And you can, and it's more upper body based, not more, but you get more involvement than you do running. Um, and so oh, it yeah. is a check, check it out. Most, a lot of gyms have them. And if they don't, 
it might be the best thousand dollar, eight hundred dollar investment for the concept two that you can you can get and go go to the uh, rowforge.com when you can get the app and it makes it just so easy and it's been my favorite. Some of my clients has a love hate relationship because I can push them more than they would be able to run. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a great way to start out and it may sound weird if you've never rode before, but I highly recommend it. Nice, yeah. Um, so do you have any other? closing words or recommendations thoughts you'd like to impart on the audience before we close this conversation well probably more in general is that that i would always just a piece of advice really um and and that's if, if you encounter people who who are very single factor oriented meaning that this is the only thing that you need to do in and everything will get better from it uh then i would be a little bit extra uh, skeptical um, uh, around those people because the the thing is it's not it's not all just black or or white it's not this camp against this camp over here it's both right and I'm uh, uh, like I usually say at my uh, at my certifications is that whenever I'm uh, having dinner um, here in Denmark with my wife she asked me. Kenneth, what what would you like to uh, to to drink with dinner? Would you like beer or wine? And I go, yes, please. I'll have both, right? <laughs> yeah. Because it, and I'll take some water as well because <laughs> it's not either, either this or that. It, it it it's both. The trick is to figure out what is it that you want to do, what is what what drives you, and what do you need to do, right? Mm. And the thing is, is that we all have to do stuff that we enjoy less because the benefit uh, will pay back in dividends, right? So, mm -hmm. so, so we simply, if you hate cardiovascular exercise and you love lifting heavy stuff, great, spend time there. Just at least know that if you neglect all the cardio stuff, over the years and you continue on only following one route at one point there's going to be there's probably going to be some problems that uh, that could have been avoided if you've done the cardiovascular training and the same thing can be said for the people who only want to run or bike and all of that you're missing out on some benefits that you can only get from the strength training stuff right yes. um so we can draw all these things in, and, and and we can say the same thing about flexibility training, and we can, we can. Uh, so basically, just make sure that you keep an open mind, at least to not uh, being biased to any one type of activity. Hey, I'm I'm all for if people enjoy also dancing and swimming and all of these things. Just make sure that you do a lot of it all, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. I love that so much. And that's, that's a big point of why, you know, I, I created this because I want people to understand what, what you want to keep doing for the rest of your life or what you enjoy. There's specific actions you can take. And if you understand what cardio is, what you understand strength training, you understand what your yeah. dancing is doing, like what you're going to get out of those yeah. things, yeah. then you'll understand the recipe, um, that you're going to need for the stuff that you love to do. Um, and so I remember back in, in, uh, man, so I was, I was a professional dancer in my twenties. I was in Los Angeles doing that whole thing. And so I taught some like fun classes and people would come and they'd be like, Ooh, I'm getting my cardio today. And I was like, well, let's shift that from like, we're having fun today. And that's important. Moving and smiling and listening to music is potentially just as important for health components as cardio, but let's know what we're getting out of each thing as opposed exactly. to saying this one thing is going to do yeah. all of it so i don't have to do the stuff i don't like to do so exactly. um, i Beautiful. love that you said that and uh, for everybody listening or watching if you want more information or are curious about what he does and want to pick his brain or have a conversation with him you can go best place is going to be go right now facebook.com um, slash slash kenneth j and that's k-e-n-n-e-t-h-j-a-y or his website drkennethj.com. Um, I highly recommend checking out the RowForge app at rowforge.com. And Kenneth, KJ, it was a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Michael. It's definitely a pleasure. Awesome. Take care. Take care. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you want to continue to become the best rider you can be for as long as possible, make sure you subscribe to my channel. I'm going to continue to put out videos and allowing you to get the most out of your body so you can get the most out of your horse.